Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak also and make a contribution to the Appropriation Bills 2018 and 2019. And in doing so, I want to voice the concern of uh, my constituents, uh, concern that they have um, about the uh, government's budget and, and budgets of the past. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this budget, uh, it is uh, in the view of my community, um, fails uh, the fairness test, it fails the fiscal responsibility test, it effectively fails middle Australia, and it also fails the most vulnerable in my community, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I'll go to one issue that I spoke about in, qu in quite a bit of detail last year, and that is the um, budget still is still pursuing, or the government rather, still pursuing measures that will force people to work until 70 years of age. Now, in my electorate, I have people who are engaged uh, in a number of um, uh, blue-collar jobs, tradies, uh, hospitality staff. I also have nurses and teachers. I have aged care workers. And if you know anything about an aged care worker, you would know that that work that they do, very important but very difficult work. These are jobs that are physically and also emotionally very demanding. So um, I spoke against these measures last year and I'll speak against them this year as well. Um, Deputy Speaker, the budget is also um, maintaining and pursuing measures to cut, to axe the energy supplement of $14 a fortnight for um, single pensioners. Um, I have 16,128 pensioners in my electorate and that's more than 15,000 elderly and vulnerable Australians that will be impacted adversely as a result of these measures, especially as we approach the coming winter. It's always an issue, in particular, during the winter. And of course, this budget still has a freeze on Medicare for specialist visits. And in my electorate, those sorts of freezes cannot you know, ad adversely affect the health and wellbeing of my community. Now, my constituents are already and have already suffered at the hands of many previous budget measures. Um, they are trying to balance the cost of living, the rising cost of living. Many of them, a large number of them, are employed in insecure work. And of course, a large number of them are unable to afford housing. Um, so, Deputy Speaker, they do wonder why the Prime Minister has chosen to prioritise um, big business and the banks in giving them a total of $80 billion tax handout when their own uh, middle Australia and my constituents need all the assistance that they can get. Uh, Deputy Speaker, a shortened Labor government won't do this. We won't because we understand what the Australian community needs and what it needs in order to help advance itself. Uh, Labor's approach to the budget offers a fairer and more responsible alternative, fairer to middle Australia and to our most vulnerable, and more responsible when it comes to budget repair. We have a plan, Deputy Speaker, a real plan to see working Australia genuinely get ahead. Uh, our plan will see those who earn up to $125,000 a year being uh, year paying less tax than they would under the government's proposed tax cuts. And of course, that's going to make a huge difference to my constituents. Um, who will be part of 4 million Australians who will get a tax cut of $928 a year, money that they desperately need and, and uh, money that reflects this, our, our Labor Party's priorities. We, we are prioritising the welfare of middle Australia, of Australians. Um, now, the government's narrative around the uh, 70 so billion dollar tax cut goes along the lines of company tax cuts will, according to the government, by definition enable investment, create more jobs, produce more productivity and uh, lead to wage increases. Well, the people in my electorate don't subscribe to trickle down economics. They don't subscribe to it because we have a history in our area of big companies abandoning our areas. Big companies such as Pacific Brands, Yakka, Dunlop, big employers that took off 
and took their business offshore in pursuit of greater profit, complaining that the Australian labour market was too expensive for them, leaving hundreds and thousands of people in my electorate literally in the lurch without employment prospects. And also in this mix is the car industry. Ford, big employer in my electorate, ditched by this government. And so you'll have to forgive my community if they don't believe or don't subscribe to the goodwill, the so-called goodwill of companies to hand down or to trickle down prosperity to them. Now, in my electorate in particular, um, Deputy Speaker, I have a huge number of refugees who've come here in recent years from Syria and Iraq. These are people that cannot find employment, not because they don't want to, but because they happen to be in a very unusual place. They've come here, many of them are highly qualified, their skills are not recognised. I've spoken about this many times before. They want to make a contribution, but they have to suffer the indignity of job network providers who are totally, totally useless in responding to their needs. So their, their prospects for employment are not, are not enhanced under this government's watch. Now, manufacturing and innovation is key, not only to Australia's future, but also to, to the northern suburbs of Melbourne, where my electorate of, of Corwell is. Now, yesterday, the Dulux plant, Dulux plant officially opened at the Merrifields Business Park in Mickleham, uh, very strongly supported by the Victorian Labor government. And um, Dulux, in opening this plant in my electorate, has created 60 local jobs, which for us is a significant number of prospective jobs. Now, Deputy Speaker, the government, in attempting to amend the research and development tax incentive um, in an effort to so-called better target it, it's turned the offsets into a disincentive. Research and development is fundamental to innovation in advancing manufacturing and creating jobs. Currently, companies can claim 8.5 percentage points above the company tax rate for their R&D expenditure up to $100 million. The new amendments will introduce progressive rates for the incentive affecting companies with an aggregated annual turnover of more than 20 million. And these rates will be tied to the amount a company spends on R&D as a proportion of total expenditure. These changes will do the opposite of incentivising companies to invest in Australia. Most established Australian companies spend less than 2% of their expenditure on R&D. This is because they are committed to investing in local jobs, local resources and other local businesses. Their rate, uh, their rate of incentive will go from 8.5 to 4%. Now, under these changes, Dulux, that's just opened up in my electorate, could lose around $100,000 each year. So to keep other aspects of their business here, companies will likely decrease their R&D, spend more, spend more and more, and either pay someone else to do it or move R&D offshore, therefore depleting Australia of its intellectual capital as well. Our country was built by strong, established businesses providing stable and decent jobs. Our future depends on workers finding the same security in Australian businesses our, as our industries advance. Small to medium enterprises in my electorate, uh, Deputy Speaker, are leading in innovation, um, in manufacturing, particularly in food manufacturing. They are desperately trying to create jobs for our local community and are wondering why they're not being given en enough assistance from this government. And of course, one of their biggest problems, as everyone in this chamber would know, is the high cost of energy. And I have some high energy cost users in my electorate. So they are actually suffering um, and, and struggling to stay afloat. Um, recently, um, uh, I, um, I, I spoke about the car manufacturing, but uh, I also want to speak on behalf of my constituents 
who own local car repair businesses in my electorate. They are absolutely thrilled that Labor is supporting legislation that will force car manufacturers to share their data with small businesses and loosen the stranglehold they have on the service and repair car market. In February, I visited the family business of Damien and Debbie Tumor of Active Motor Repairs in Craigieburn. They and other business owners detailed the difficulties they were facing with the advent of car dealerships monopolising the repair and warranty market. The lack of data sharing in particular has affected their businesses and highlighted the importance of legislating a mandatory code for data sharing. Business owners like Damien and Debbie feel that the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission inquiry into car retailing industry report, which was released in December 2017, should be adopted in its entirety. In short, the report concluded that vehicle manufacturers that sell into the Australian market uh, limit access to service and repair information for independent repairers. The report also found that this created an artificial monopoly and allowed manufacturers to inflate the markups on servicing and repairs. Laws in the USA and the EU, Deputy Speaker, prevent this abuse of market power. The ACCC's report further concluded that independent repairers were experiencing issues gaining access to technical information needed to repair and service new cars. Access to technical information held by car manufacturers was becoming increasingly important as repairing and servicing new cars relied on access to electronic information and data produced by car manufacturers. Car manufacturers had previously committed to providing independent repairers with the same access to technical information as the manufacturer's authorised dealers on commercially fair and reasonable terms. However, the ACCC discovered problems with the detail and timelines of the technical information given. The ACCC considered that independent repairers having access to this technical information was important to ensure competition and ultimately to benefit the consumers. The ACCC proposed a mandatory scheme for car manufacturers to share technical information. Now, the mandatory code recommendation is supported by Labor. All the independent repair associations, the consumer bodies, the auto associations, including NRMA and the RACQ, the insurance industry, the new car dealers association and all major auto repair chains, for example, Kmart Tire and Auto Service, Repco Authorised Service and Bridgestone. I wrote to the Treasurer on behalf of my constituents detailing my support for the independent car repairers. In April, the Treasurer wrote back saying that the market study would inform, and I quote the government's further consideration of these important issues, quite, quote unquote. Deputy Speaker, while the government and the Treasurer is considering what to do, Labor has acted and come out in support of small businesses and their need to access data to ensure their survival. Under a Labor government, car manufacturers were required to share information about their vehicles with every Australian mechanic. Australia-wide, this means a boost of 23,000 independent mechanics and will allow car, car owners more choice when it comes to servicing and repairing their vehicles. We will stick up for small business, for tr Aussie trades and keeping family costs of living down, um, as, la as Labor leader Bill Shorten has said. Independent mechanics have been going to the wall while the Turnbull government sits on its hands. There's no reason, Deputy Speaker, that this reform shouldn't be implemented immediately, in particular in the car repair sector, which traditionally attracts lots of young people, and particularly young men, with apprenticeships, pathways for job opportunities into the future. And it is an absolute disgrace that this government can sit on its hands while local car repairers face the prospect of being put out of business by, corp by car manufacturers who are behaving in a way that my constituents are right about. Corporate culture does not take into consideration the needs of people, does not put the needs of people ahead of its profit-making culture. That is why my constituents do not subscribe to the trickle-down theory. That is why they oppose the corporate tax cuts. And that is why this government's priority is all wrong. And it's all wrong in relation to the people that I represent who need assistance from the government in order to be able to meet the cost of living 
find jobs and get on with living their lives and supporting their families, their children and their neighbourhoods. The question is that this